Okay, hi everybody, and welcome to the last lecture this semester in our continuing Visiting Artist Lecture Series that's sponsored by the Undergraduate Program, the Graduate Program, and the Center for New Art. And, um, oh, am <laughs> da 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll pick this up again in the spring semester. I want to really encourage you guys to make an effort to come. I really appreciate you being here. This is so valuable to you. Uh, it's valuable to me as well. I love seeing the different points of view and approaches that artists bring. And I'm always surprised by everybody we've brought so far. So, uh, you know, you'll see people you agree with, people you disagree with, ideas that you identify with, et cetera. Today, I'd like to welcome Jeff Thompson. Uh, Jeff is an artist, programmer, hacker, and educator based in the New York City area. He is currently assistant professor and program director of visual art and technology at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, and his artist in residence at Bell Labs. And uh, it, it's not in the bio, but he just got back from Cambridge where he listed a few at the Hogwarts Academy. <laughs> um, Thompson has exhibited and performed his work internationally at venues including the Museum of the Moving Image, Sheldon Museum of Art, the Taubman Museum of Art, Site Santa Fe, Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, the Jersey City Museum, and the Weissman Art Museum. Commissions have included uh, Abandoned Normal Devices, Brighton Digital Festival, Rhizome, Turbulence, and Harvest Works. In addition to his studio praxis, Thompson co-runs Drift Station, a curatorial collaboration that mounts international experimental exhibitions. Jeff has been in residence with us this semester. If you've been over to Power Art, you might have seen him. And he's been working on a project that he'll talk about briefly today. But without further ado, join me in welcoming Jeff Thompson. Thanks, Michael. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, when are your final projects due? Like, really? Sorry. Next week. So you guys are like really super awesome for being here today. Um, Anyway, cool. Uh, thanks, Michael, uh, for having me and for letting me come play with the robot this semester. It's been really cool. And a uh, big thanks to Seth, too, for helping me make the robot do things, because otherwise it would just sit there. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my work and the kinds of things that I do. And um, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. I work very much kind of project-based. so. In some ways, like any of the things that I'm talking about, I could talk about for the whole time. So we're going to kind of blow through a bunch of stuff. But if you want, you can check out my website um, for more info. Uh, also, you'll see I write a lot of code as part of my artistic practice. It, 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 I build tools to make my work. And um, so if you're into that kind of thing, you can go on GitHub and check out all of that stuff. Um, but I'm going to go in chronological order, but I wanted to kind of um, Mostly what I'm going to talk about is kind of recent stuff, but I wanted to start in a place that I think kind of sets up a lot of the things that run through my work. Um, and this is going back to just after grad school. And um, for a long time, I've been really interested in um, uh, kind of like finding things in the world that are interesting and then doing something to them, manipulating them in a way that's kind of meaningful or conceptual and then just kind of showing the results. So applying a process to something and then sort of seeing what happens. And you'll see that a lot later in the work where it's being done computationally. Um, this is before I started writing code, um, though I still end up making these incredibly tedious things for some reason over and over and over. I, I never learn. Um, but I've also been really interested in, you know, I think that's very much related to the idea of remix. And that was really kind of a framing way for me of thinking about things is, is thinking about remix. And so this is from a series of uh, remixed films, uh, conceptually remixed films. This is um, Paris, Texas, which is an amazing movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and I've removed all shots where there's any people in them. So the piece is called Paris with no people. And um, all that's left is these kind of like landscapes, vistas, interior spaces, this kind of like empty space. Um, and this is all done by hand, which is like incredibly tedious. Um, and it runs about you know six minutes or something. So like the bulk of the movie is people doing things, and all you're left with here is that kind of stuff in between. And I'm not going to play the whole thing because this is really just to sort of set up kind of where the work goes from there. So that's after grad school, and then now we're jumping ahead a good number of years later. Um, 
to these images. And I, these look really different, I think, than that, uh, than Paris is no people, but really the kind of motivation is very similar. Um, these are made from found photographs. There's a process that they undergo, um, sort of remixing the pixels, uh, and then the result is something new and kind of surprising. Um, and so this is called seam sorting, this series. And um, if you've used Photoshop's content-aware scaling before, you might have kind of experienced this algorithm. Um, the idea is, to, to, has any of you used this before in Photoshop? Where you can like shrink and expand images. Um, it's kind of amazing. You can do like this sort of thing where it transforms the image and it keeps um, important parts of the photograph and then deletes or shrinks the unimportant pieces. And uh, this algorithm is called uh, seam carving, and essentially, we don't need to get into too many details, but the way it works is you convert an image to something like this, and then it finds pathways of least energy through the image. So in this case, starting in the, the bottom center, sort of like looks at all the neighboring pixels and sees where the least amount of change is, and then it keeps kind of following that to make a pathway through the image. And Photoshop uses this to uh, stretch uh, and expand an image, but I was really interested in this idea of um, using it to sort and reorganize the pixels. And so what happens is um, I apply this to found images and it, it creates this pathway. You can kind of see it here. Uh, through the image, it grabs all those pixels in that line and then sorts them by color and puts them back in place and then shifts over and does that again and again and again uh, across the image. So they start out as images of like sunsets and um, desert landscapes and stuff like that, and they get turned into these kind of like stirred up things. And this is a close up of what it looks like. I, when I print these, they're printed really large, um, and I want you to be able to still see all the pixels so they, they remain kind of crisp so that you can see the kind of material that they're made out of. Um, and so this is all done with custom software, uh, which I right in pieces and actually the whole thing here is automated so I, I automated the Google image search uh, I would put in a term it would download like a couple hundred photographs for each search term uh, and then it applies this algorithm uh, to the image and then actually what it does is it rotates at 90 degrees and then does it again to that same image and then rotates it so um, actually once I, what ended up happening was you know running this and I had like 10,000 options to choose from and then manually going through and kind of picking uh, which I really love, like I was sitting in meetings and stuff while my art was being made by my computer, which I think is awesome, I really love that. Um, but uh, you know, to me what's fascinating is the transformation of these images into new things. They still have this kind of weird, you know, like this is a mountain sunset and there's this kind of like sunset light still in it, which is crazy, it shouldn't be able to be there. Um, and in some ways, like I really haven't changed the image at all, no pixels are being modified except for their location. So I think of it kind of like um, stirring cream into coffee, right? Like uh, if you could somehow stir it the other direction and pull it back out. Like this, if you undid the algorithm, you'd end up with the image that you started with, um, which to me is really fascinating. And also for me, a lot of these are about um, removing my hand as much as possible. So creating a system, letting it go to work, and then um, sort of removing aesthetic decision making as an artist, things like uh, what should I photograph or what colors do I want to use or something like that. Um, the next project, uh, so a lot of my work too is in collaboration. I, I think of, uh, I work with other artists, I work with scientists. Um, I also think like in the previous project that I am collaborating in certain ways with things like algorithms or tools. Um, to create images, uh, artworks. And um, this is a project with uh, my good friend Alex Myers, who's also an artist who makes um, art games. And um, for the past five or six years, we've... Nope, does that do anything? Anyway, uh, hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, so for the past five years, we've run this event called Games Plus Plus, which is a game jam. Um, where people come for 12 hours and you make a game completely from scratch um, based on a secret theme. And uh, it's an intense, awesome, fun day. If any of you are interested in games, you should totally come. We do it in Hoboken now. It's really cool, in March. Um, and every year we forget what happened the year previous and we decide to do something insane. Um, we always make name badges for everybody and we 
for some reason, decide to make these like elaborate things instead of like Xerox to easy to make. And so a few years ago, we made these like handmade circuit boards um, for everybody that participated. Um, and the result is this game called You've Been Blinded and Thrown in a Dungeon. And um, the game has no video. It's a completely videoless, videoless video game. The only uh, output is that little vibration motor up there. And the, the idea of the game basically is you've been thrown in this dungeon and you have to wander around sort of like feeling by touch where you are and you walk over different uh, terrain like sand and water and tiles and stuff like that. Um, and so different uh, haptic vibration patterns to kind of wander through this space. And it's amazing what your mind can do, like putting together this game, this space, um, without any visuals. Uh, and actually now this has spawned a whole bunch of other projects that uh, I made some tablet games that are all completely non-visual where you like ride a bike by sonar and stuff like this, which actually you can do, it's kind of crazy, uh, like in real life. And uh, now working with Bell Labs on this haptic messaging platform, thinking about sending touch over your cell phone network or something like that. Um, so the idea of sorting has been a kind of a, a thing that's run through a lot of my work. And the other thing, uh, another thing that's really run through that is the idea of everything of something, like exhausting uh, a set of something, um, which has led to crazy things. Like uh, I was artist in residence at a supercomputing facility, and we made six billion MP3 files, which is kind of awesome, uh, which I'm not going to show you today. But um, I wanted to show you this project, which is called Every Possible Photograph. Um, and I became interested in the idea of using up a piece of technology. Um, I, I had a lot of photographer friends and I thought, um, this is cool, but photography is so subjective, like so much art, it's so subjective, like how you choose to frame a photograph, how you choose to uh, manipulate it or print it. And I thought, okay, wait, what if we just like make every photograph computationally, then like photography is done. Like I can just end an entire field. Uh, I can throw away my camera. Um, of course, the math becomes kind of insane and which is why we still have photography. Um, so in some ways it's, it's meant to be an impossible project. Um, but what also fascinated with me was that this would be a time machine basically, right? Like you would have noise, you would have some kind of order, but embedded in this like insane number of meaningless images, there would be a picture of me uh, standing in front of you guys. There would be a picture of somebody else here today. There would be me with a different haircut. Uh, there'd be pictures of how I die, um, every possible future. All these things would be embedded in this kind of uh, system, which is crazy and fascinating to me. And, um, so the way the piece works is it starts um, actually from this photograph. This is Niepce's uh, 1826 um, view out his window. It's considered the first kind of fixed photograph, um, which seems like cheating maybe uh, to offset kind of to this, but um, this is how long it's gonna take to complete uh, the project. Uh, so it's never gonna happen. So jumping ahead to this like first photograph is basically statistically meaningless, right? Like, compared to the sheer number of images. Um, and every time this runs, this is a little bit of what it looks like, uh, every time it runs, it starts from where it left off. So the idea is that, you know, down the road, it's gonna, you know, just kind of keep going and keep going. Um, did you have a question? How do you come up with that number? Um, you're putting me on the spot now, I'm not sure. It has something to do with the number of pixels, the number of values for each pixel, and then the factorial of that, I think. It'd be way, way bigger. Yeah. So you can see, like, the resolution is really low. It's grayscale. Um, yeah, to do color becomes, you know, much, much more for sure. Yeah. Uh, it has yet to arrive at anything interesting. But, um, the next project is called Mirror Test. This was um, commissioned by an organization in the Netherlands called Impact that does really cool stuff. They do a festival every year. Um, and they had um, put out a call for projects that look at um, uh, kind of like uh, the future of interaction between computers and humans. And this has been something I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and I proposed a project teaching my computer uh, or computers to be able to recognize themselves. And um, this is you know, something I've been thinking a lot about. And I, I really love this quote by Ray Kurzweil, uh, who maybe you know, is predicting things like that you'll be able to upload your brain to a computer and stuff like that. Um, and this book, The Singularity is Nearest, crazy, like 
really crazy. But he says, our forebears expected the future to be pretty much like their present, which had been pretty much like their past. Um, and it was really thinking, you know, we keep talking about this idea of like AI and computers becoming sentient, uh, and that like one thing is going to push it over the edge, uh, like some Terminator technology or something. Um, but I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be these little incremental things. Like we're already doing this, like Amazon and Netflix and these all these like technologies are slowly adding more capability. And I kind of feel like one day we're going to wake up and realize that we've crossed that boundary without even really realizing it happened. Um, and so, you know, as an artist too, I build technologies and they're useful for me in the studio, but the, I don't worry like an engineer might that they're actually useful, like in, in real life or as a product or something like that. So the idea of teaching my computer to recognize itself is not necessarily a useful thing for it to know, but it's a poetic act, it's an artistic act that's meant to kind of explore that, that space. Um, so I spent a month in Utrecht and uh, worked with computer vision to train my computer. This is an early test, uh, but I love this image. It's drawing boxes where it thinks computers are. And so it's drawn one around my face or part of my face and one around my uh, phone, which I really love. Like it's conflating us as being the same, which is kind of beautiful. Um, and the resulting software when it started working looks like this. So I built this kind of back end. Basically what you do is take lots and lots of pictures of the thing you want your computer to be able to recognize and then you also feed it lots of pictures of not that thing. Uh, and there's some, like I'm kind of a data nerd. I don't know if any of you are data nerds, but there's amazing like um, databases of pictures of not the thing that you can download from the internet. Um, if you want later I'll show you their like incredible weird stuff. Um, so this is kind of the back end. It takes these pictures and um, the result is this sort of interactive performance uh, thing that happens in the gallery. So people were asked to bring in their computers. Most people brought their phone, but um, laptops or whatever, and they get put on here. It's a little hard to see, but there's a camera on this big arm that swings around and we take lots of pictures. It teaches the computer live um, and spits out the code for recognizing the phone. But um, because I'm an artist, not an engineer, I'm not interested in this being useful necessarily or like giving somebody code. Um, what I love is that this is text. And so what you're seeing on the right is the computer vision algorithm, the, the trained thing for somebody's computer. Um, and on the left, you're seeing what the computer thinks it looks like. So it's super reduced, it's black and white, it's, um, you know, we, we think of these things as really seeing, but actually they're just seeing kind of like patterns and things like this. Um, and so these would get printed to books, sort of print on demand books live in the gallery, um, and then the person would get this. And um, I'm still in love with books. Like I think print books are still amazing. Um, this book was also designed to be able to be read by both us and by computers. So it's typeset in this font that's meant to be really easy for computers to be able to um, read and understand. It had a, a QR code on each one so that you could scan it and go to the code online and be able to, um, to read it that way. Uh, so this idea kind of of like publishing books that are both for us and for uh, our devices. Uh, the next project, which we're going to totally like zip through really fast. Um, I've given hour long talks on this, which it, it really kind of deserves. So we're going to do like the really wide overview. But um, uh, in 2012, I was given a commission to watch all 456 episodes of Law and Order, uh, which I did, and uh, take screenshots of all the computers on the show, which I did. It's about 11,000. Uh, screenshots. Um, it took me a year and a half to do this. It was an insane, amazing undertaking. Um, and Law and Order is totally perfect for this. Have, can I assume you all have watched Law and Order? Yes. Has anyone not watched Law and Order? Oh my God. Which, which Law and Order? The original. Okay. That's amazing. Okay. There's almost always like one person, and it's hard to imagine because it's like everywhere. Like you can't get away from Law and Order. Um, but it's the perfect show for, I think, examining our relationship with technology. It um, ran from 1990 to 2010. You have this huge kind of like arc of time where we went from computers being this shared thing um, in offices to like complete ubiquity, right? Like everyone's carrying one around. 
Um, so I spent, um, oh, and this was commissioned by Rhizome, which is an amazing organization if you don't know them. Um, and so I'm going to like zip through kind of the overview of the uh, kind of categories of images here. Uh, I also took uh, down all the quotes about computers, which are amazing. And I'll show you in a little bit like uh, fake URLs and, so you, you know, all this you, stuff. Uh, didn't write an algorithm to grab this. Thing. No. You watched 256 episodes and wrote down everything about computers or grab whatever information right. about computers. Actually, what's really interesting, I totally forgot this, is um, the mirror test, the last project, uh, was born out of thinking about how I could automate this, realizing that you probably couldn't very accurately, um, and then trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. So this is totally by hand. I watched it at one and a half speed, which drove my wife insane. Uh, I got used to it. And I'm not going to, I don't think I have a slide of it, but I built like custom hardware for this and software to do the capturing. Um, I think binge watching at this magnitude requires special equipment. Um, how long did it take you to do? How long uh, almost two years. two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember computer desks. Like I had one of these when we were a kid. Uh, it was like special furniture just for computers. They were really crappy. They're made out of like fake wood. Um, depending on how old you are, it either had a CD thing built in or a floppy disk thing built in. Um, We've written a lot about things like mainframe computing, you know, the history of that, cloud computing. Um, no one has written any books about the computer desk, which bums me out. Um, but it's no surprise. These are crappy things that got thrown away. We don't need them anymore because you've got your laptop. Um, and so I think if we want to, like, look at our relationship with technology um, with things like this, we're not going to find them in books and things like that. We're going to find them in things like television. Um, so this is the first computer on the show, and this is, uh, what is it, nine minutes and 32 seconds into the first episode. Uh, it's right over there. What's that? Uh, I got really, really good at seeing computers. Uh, yeah, and um, so the, I should have brought it with me, actually. I, I made this touch bar to capture screenshots, uh, so it was like really big, and you just sort of touch it. And um, I got this reflex of doing this. <laughs> and seriously, for months afterwards, I'd be watching TV, and my arm would want to go like this when I would see a computer. Um, and I totally cannot watch the show anymore. It's totally a disaster. Um, but you can see it's blurred. It's in the background. It's really only on screen for like two or three frames. Um, and this, that's the position of computers through basically the whole, sh the whole first half of the show. Um, they're turned off. They're not used very often. It's a shared appliance. Uh, it also reminds you that the early 90s is really the very late 80s. It's um, post-it notes stuck on it. You know, um, I think this is the perfect summary, right? Like he's sitting on this desk with a turned off computer facing away and reading from a piece of paper. Um, this is the first episode where a computer is actually turned on. This is nine episodes in. Um, and so even as we move forward in time, the computer is still really often in the background, um, behind people's desks. Um, this doesn't look special to you, probably. This is a momentous moment in uh, Computers on Law and Order. This is from season five. This is the first computer that's gone from behind someone's desk to on their desk. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think it would take that long. Um, but I think these like little banal details is why Law and Order is perfect for this. Um, if you watch SVU, it's like ridiculous. It's giant touchscreen computers in the New York City Police Department. Never happening. Um, it's much, I think this version of Law and Order shows much better like the normal computer user of the time. This is the first laptop, season two. I really like this laptop. Um, so, you know, and another interesting thing is that as these things start becoming more and more ubiquitous, they also become harder to spot because they're getting smaller and smaller. Here's two detectives facing each other on matching laptops. Um, they get harder to see. They're used in various locations. This is the site of a prostitution ring um, down there. I got really good at seeing computers right there. Uh, right there. <laughs> um, and then, of course, smartphones and mobile computing. I would have thought this would be way more common in the show. Um, you know, it ends in 2010, but it wasn't so much. This is the first BlackBerry. Season 12, uh, which is also the first season of the Pixel. Um, 
you know, so interestingly too, I had to think about what is a computer. So is a phone a computer? Uh, and I decided that if you were doing something with it that you can't do with a normal phone, uh, then it's a computer. So texting, photography, that kind of thing. Um, also like the gesture stuff, like we have books about computers or uh, smartphones, but recording this kind of like distracted gesture in this totally natural way. Uh, this is the DA, he likes doing this, where he shows you his phone in, the, in an expository moment in the show. Um, and then this is one of the last images from the show, and this is totally perfect, like two people having a face-to-face -face conversation and somebody checking their email. Uh, I also captured, of course, software along with this. Um, there's kind of classification, so we get these blue screen interfaces. Um, the project was launched after it was all done at the Museum of the Moving Image, which was really cool. Um, and we had a panel discussion with some people that worked on Law & Order, um, which was really neat. And um, actually, if I go back. So these are fake. This is very cool. This is one of the things I learned. Um, it was really expensive. Like when you made a show like this in the 90s, you had film cameras, which you had to sync the screen frame rate with the frame rate of your camera. Otherwise, it got weird looking. Um, and that was really, really expensive to do. You had to hire special companies. That, that's all they did. Um, so this is a gutted monitor with a transparency behind it. It's like a big light box, basically, uh, which I really, really want one. I'm like, that would be the best thing ever. Uh, so these are fake, which is kind of cool. These are fake, too. Uh, another kind of um, trope, this like big bar at the top with text and a logo, stuff below. The mouse is upside down, too, which is kind of nice. <laughs> Uh, and then you, you know, because it goes from the 1990 forward, you see this kind of um, birth of graphical user interfaces, a movement into contemporary operating systems. Did you also uh, see some, um, you know, kind of utopian, did you track utopian claims? Like the computer can find this criminal, for example. You know, it was actually inaccurate. It's really nice. They do almost none of that on this. Really? It's like the most boring stuff. There's a little hacker stuff here and there. Um, but mostly it's like in the background, which I think is really nice. Um, I also recorded websites on the show. I have a list if you go online of all of these. Um, this is one the internet seems to really like. I don't know why. The baronmuchhumpen.com. Um, there's also upyourbutt.net, bootyboys.bz, uh, oh, which is here. It's really great. Um, and then fake social media stuff like ulens, be friends, face place. Um, uh, fake Google Street View, and then other detritus like screensavers. Does anyone know this have a name? Does anyone know what this is called? It's called Mystify Your Mind. Which is kind of great. Uh, this is called Serene Screen Marine Aquarium, uh, Mac only. Uh, you know uh, all these little things that are gone. Loading screens for software. Um, you know, file browsers, file types, file sizes, all this stuff kind of embedded. It's not part of the story, it's just sort of in the background. Buttons, user interfaces. Um, and then things like computer books, like the computer desk, like these used to be a thing. Um, this is amazing, the Internet International Directory, which then I went on eBay and bought, because I was like, I have to have this. Um, it's beautiful, it's literally like a phone book for the internet, and it's got like an annotated list of websites, and then, um, a description of them, and they're almost all dead now, which is too bad. Mid-90s, probably? Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I actually have a Twitter bot that tweets uh, websites from this, which is pretty great. Um, and so when this was done, I mean, I, I was looking back and thinking, like, there must be some other things we can gain from this. Like, this is an artistic project. It's, it's research from an artistic perspective. Um, but again, as kind of a data nerd, I was thinking there must be something that we can see here. And one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, this is the number of computers per season. So it's one through 20, 1990 through 2010. Uh, and then the number of computers, and this is really fascinating, right? Like we see this steady uh, increase, which you would expect, uh, but then we see this weird dip before it shoots up at the end. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking with people. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that, that kind of dip. Um, one would be ubiquity, right? Like by the early 2000s, 
everybody has a computer, every college student has a computer, we're using them at work, you're really used to it, so the show doesn't need to kind of reflect that as much. Um, and then the other reason I think is the dot-com bubble burst, right? And like everybody was thinking, well, I don't know if we're, this internet thing is really going to be a thing. Like maybe this was just a fad and it's going away. Um, and this is backed up by quotes from the show. Then her cousin Jeff, not me, convinced her to jump on the internet bandwagon. It was a disaster. It's <laughs> kind of lovely. Um, and interestingly, <laughs> yeah. Um, interestingly, too, this is mapped very close to the NASDAQ closing price for the same period. So uh, if we overlay these here, we can see kind of a similar thing. We don't see that huge spike at the end because we have the financial crisis, but uh, kind of very similar correlation. Um, and I like these kinds of things. I like that um, in my studio practice, I'm producing useful things that are an offshoot of my work. Um, I make decidedly uh, conceptual poetic things like I watched all of Law and Order and took screenshots of computers like that's not super useful on its own but that like spinning off from that can be interesting and useful sorts of things um, and so you know thinking about these cast off details like I said um, you know I think we are able to capture like the prefix cyber here these kind of lost little pieces um, you know, ways of exploring the computer of these things that are sort of thrown away. So I think if you're really psyched on like media and you want an excuse to watch um, like 400 hours of television, like there's a lot of cool stuff to be found inside there. Um, totally changing course now. Um, this is a project from several years ago called Interp. Uh, this is commissioned by an organization, a really cool organization called Turbulence that sadly is gone. Uh, they're one of the few places that commission net art, art that lives on the internet. Um, and I had been playing around for like a year with this process called photogrammetry. Has anybody done like 1, 2, 3D catch before? Nobody? A couple? You should check it out. It's very cool. You can take pictures of, you know, an object from a bunch of different perspectives and then the software reconstructs the 3D model of that object. It's really, really cool. Um, but I'm not the kind of person that likes to use tools for what they're meant for. I like to break things, and I think the most interesting things happen when you push a tool past what it's meant to do or use it for a purpose it was never intended for. Um, and so I thought, okay, cool, I can like give it pictures and make an object, but what happens if I give it like 100 pictures of totally random, unrelated things? What is it going to spit out? Um, and the result is things that look kind of like this. Um, but of course, it's not quite that easy to make it work. So I had to spend a lot of time experimenting and building tools to kind of make this happen. And uh, essentially, what I did was put these photographs inside a fake 3D space. The way photogrammetry works is it looks for reference points in the background. And that's how it triangulates position. Um, so I wrote software that would situate these photographs inside this fake 3D room and then rotate around. Uh, and then it also, you see, blends them together. So it's like able to kind of connect those a little bit better. And I ran this on my entire photo library, 10,000 images or so at the time, um, in 100 photo chunks, which resulted in about 100 uh, 3D models. And, um, you know, like Law & Order and all these other things, there's a lot of like, automation that's possible, and then there's a lot of really tedious hand stuff. So I had to clean up these models. You can see the room still gets kind of captured in some of these. So reclaiming the model out of the center, weeding, cleaning up, stuff like that. Um, but the result lives online. Um, so this is the website for the project, um, which you can go to Turbulence and check out. Um, all the models are here. You can go scrolling through. You can select one, and it'll open it up uh, in a browser and it's actually interactive, it's JavaScript, so you can rotate the model, zoom in um, like this and interact with it. Um, I've also been really interested in like um, the web as a platform for exhibiting work because it allows a kind of non-linearity that the gallery doesn't. So you go to a museum, um, you know, you walk through the exhibition and they've really planned it out. Like you go in one door, you go out a different door, it's very kind of linear and straightforward. Um, but online, and especially when you can like apply data 
to things like this. You'll see down at the bottom, I've measured the, um, the brightness, the hue, which is color, the uh, volume of the object, um, the year of the photograph, and um, then there's some like classifications, which I'm clicking on here, uh, which I noted from these that it was weird. It ended up in these kind of like um, different archetypes of object. Um, so when you go online, then you can sort by those things. So instead of just seeing it in one way, you can look at them by year, you can look at them by brightness or color, or how big the 3D model is, um, which I really like. Like it's different pathways through the work. And actually as a result, now my portfolio online, my website, you can do the same thing. So you can sort by different kinds of parameters as a way of kind of exploring that work. This is all the images. Uh, you can also download them all as STLs, or I'm sorry, as OBJ files, which is kind of cool. So you, and they are, many of them are 3D printable. They would take some work to be printable. But, um, oh, and then there's an about where you can read lots more geeky detail. Uh, let's see, what's next? Ah, White Noise Boutique. So this is a project from about a year ago. Now we're getting close to the present day. Uh, this was commissioned by the Brighton Digital Festival, which is very cool uh, in Brighton, England. Um, it's a pop-up shop that sells boutique custom-made white noise, which then is hand-cut to vinyl records. Uh, yeah, uh, which looks like this. And so um, I spent the summer before um, doing lots and lots of research on things like mathematics, cryptography, um, sound stuff, and um, designing the shop and uh, then I flew to the United Kingdom, spent about five days building out the shop, you know, all the furniture and stuff like that is all made just for this. Uh, and then about 10 days running the shop. And I sold about 100 records while I was there, which was amazing, uh, and had really interesting conversations with all different kinds of people about white noise, randomness, chance, uh, cryptography, that sort of thing. Um, and more and more, I'm really loving these projects that merge seemingly unrelated things that require a lot of research for me. So this is sound art, cryptography, performance, furniture design, graphic design, mathematics, um, all these kinds of things coming together. Um, oh, as a, a weird aside, um, I have started more and more like building things in 3D before I make them, um, especially like uh, I download 3D files from like Master Car, or like um, I'm able to prep or like try out things in 3D first, and uh, um, it's been really interesting and kind of weird. Uh, but this was the most surreal thing because I was doing it overseas. I couldn't go, like, visit the physical space, and so they sent me a floor plan and some photographs, and I built the shop in 3D, uh, and then I built the furniture in the model like I was, you know, I made sheets of plywood basically in the computer, um, and I, I built it virtually and was able to render it. And then when I got there and I was standing in the store, it was the freakiest thing because I felt like I had totally been there before. It was like complete deja vu. Um, really weird, really kind of cool. Um, anyway, so yeah, like I said, I ran the shop for 10 days. Um, you know, this was talking to a lot of people, uh, explaining the process, as you can imagine. Um, so if you come into the shop, uh, you're presented with this kind of information sheet first. Um, you can pick from a variety of random number generators uh, that run the range from uh, tube-driven 1950s lab equipment uh, all the way to cut, um, cutting edge cryptographic algorithms, all these different kinds of things. Um, this is like my nerd litmus test. Uh, has anybody read the book A Million Random Digits? Does anyone know this book? This is an amazing book. Um, I'm such a nerd. Um, you guys are like, no, what are you talking about? Um, so this is a book in the 1950s that the Rand Corporation made. It's literally a printed book of a million random digits. They're really, really random, which at the time was super difficult to do. Um, and it, it's a beautiful thing. I, I really love it. It's super useless now. Um, but it was really useful at the time for things like running simulations. It was really important for nuclear weapons research. Uh, where you need random numbers to kind of feed those things. Um, and I bought the machine. I don't know if I have a picture of it here. I bought the machine that they used to generate their random numbers for the shop. Um, for some of them as well, uh, these methods, you can input a seed number, a, a number that kind of kicks off the process. So I have casino quality dice and a bingo cage, which is very random. Also, yarrow sticks, which I gathered on the shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, this is used for reading the I Ching which is kind of a 
classic Chinese text, uh, essentially to use to generate random numbers. An untuned FM radio is actually giving you um, atmospheric noise, so I have that. And then a little microscope, which I totally love this little thing, for checking the grooves of the record. Um, and then this is the machine. I bought this on Craigslist. Uh, it weighs like 40 pounds. It's about 60 years old, and I spent like a month cleaning it, rewiring the whole thing, and then I built control electronics and custom software to kind of run the whole thing. Um, and you can see there a little record blank that gets cut onto the record. Uh, this is what they look like when they're done. They get a label that tells you how they were made. Um, it also, then your noise undergoes a battery of tests for statistical randomness because this is a boutique. This is a very high quality white noise experience. Uh, so you get to know what tests your, uh, your method passed. And oh, and then they're sealed with these tamper proof stickers. Uh, so in case you wanted to use your noise for cryptographic purposes, you could know that no one had intercepted your noise. Um, and then they also have a digital download uh, if you want it so that you know, it's got a little code. Um, and I love shops. Like, I think shops are the most amazing thing. They're like an art installation. They're this, like, carefully made, carefully curated kind of experience. Um, and so this shop is really like a celebration of capitalism and a critique at the same time. Um, you know, I think tech culture is really promising this idea of, like, complete customization that, um, you know, Amazon curates what you see based on the things it knows about you. Netflix does the same thing. Um, 3D printing is promising this too, right? That you'll um, be able to download an object and tweak its parameters and then print it out. Um, and I, I like that this is kind of like blurring all those things. I don't know where the line between critique and celebration is. Um, it was a performance for me to run the shop, but I'm also just working there. Um, and again, like the, the definition between when I'm just a guy and when I'm um, a performer in the shop is really kind of blurred and unclear. Um, and in thinking about this, putting together the talk, I, I realized that actually shops are a thing that have totally run through my work before. Um, this is a show called Bookstore that uh, we put on maybe three or four years ago at a, a, our gallery called Drift Station. This was when uh, I lived in Lincoln. I, I run Drift Station with my wife. It's a curatorial collaboration. Um, and we do all different kinds of shows. And this we solicited artist books, zines, and alternative publications for a, um, a shop slash reading room in the gallery. Uh, and we got 1,200 books. It was amazing, like from everywhere. And um, so this is a shot of the gallery. They're up on the, on the walls. We also had poetry readings. Um, and then people came in and you could read, you could uh, buy a book. It's really awesome. So I don't know, I'm, I'm obsessed with stores. Sometimes I think I could totally quit being an artist and just run a store. Uh, and then on the last night of the shop, uh, we had a white noise listening session. Uh, we listened to 40 minutes, 10 minutes of four different generators with a minute of silence in between. And I rented these amazing speakers, like these gigantic, super pristine, beautiful speakers. Um, and I didn't know who was going to show up. I thought maybe like a handful of people. And it was pretty crowded. It was really awesome. Um, and if you have some time, you should try doing this sometime because like two minutes of white noise, it's kind of annoying. But 40 minutes at super high volume, you trip out. Like you start hallucinating, like visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations. Um, people afterwards had super different reactions to different ones. Some of them made people sick. Um, one of the generators made my nose run. It was the weirdest thing, not the other ones, but like I could feel my sinuses draining. People said they were hearing singing and voices and I don't know, it was kind of this like amazing sort of communal experience. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is actually the project I'm working on here. Uh, it's in parentheses because it's not finished. Um, so a little over a year ago, I teach at Stevens Institute of Technology, which is really mostly an engineering school. Uh, and, you know, I would super encourage all of you, there's like weird, cool stuff happening all over this campus, I'm sure. It's probably like in basements and stuff like that, but um, Stevens is a really small campus compared to William Patterson, and there's really cool, weird stuff, including this electron microscope lab. Um, and they came and knocked on my office door one day, and they were like, hey, um, we have some photography equipment we want to get rid of. Would you want it? And I said, sure. And they, I was like, what do you guys do? And they said, we have this electron microscope lab. And I was like, I want to see that. That sounds really cool. Um, and so for 
like six months, I went over there and they taught me how to use this thing. Um, it's about the size of a big refrigerator. Um, and they were super cool. They let me go in and put weird stuff under the microscope and um, look at weird little things. Um, this is a close-up of looking at a sample on there. So w the things you put in there, you know, maybe are about the size of like a dime, maybe a little smaller. Um, and it can see super, super tiny. Like individual bacteria and crazy stuff. And um, I became obsessed with dust. Um, this is actually a piece of dust on the surface of my hard drive. And um, so I was taking lots of pictures of these things and they're like, well, you know, we have this thing called a fib. And I was like, what is the fib? And they're like, oh, this is the focused ion beam. It's basically a tiny, tiny, tiny laser beam that can slice objects. Uh, and then you can take pictures of them from the side. So you can see like what's inside things. And they do this for individual bacteria. Like you can slice up a bacteria and then re-image it in 3D. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, so this is a piece of dust that we found. Um, actually, what you're looking at here is not the dust itself. It's the dust coated in 99.999% pure gold, which makes it image better. Um, but these things are super tiny and fragile, and so um, it tended to want to blow away. So then we coated it in pure platinum. So that square is a, the, the gold is like two atoms thick. This is thicker in the context of this. So I think this is the fanciest dust ever. It's like gold and platinum coated. Um, and what we did is use the fib to slice, image, slice, image, slice, image, which is what you're seeing here. Um, so the very dark part, that's the actual dust. The platinum is around it. Um, and it's crazy. You can see like different materials inside and little cavities. And, um, and what you're seeing here is actually super cleaned up version of it. Um, I was, I, like the view would move around and stuff, and I'd say, why is it doing that? Like, can't we make it still? And they're like, Jeff, we're talking, like this whole thing is two microns across. They're like, you're lucky we can get it this still at all. Um, so I had to do a lot of cleanup and post-processing. I wrote some software to automate this to kind of align things, uh, and then lots of Photoshop batch processing. Um, and then this is now, and you can see, oops, here, like the bottom edge moves up, right? Because you're seeing it in 3D. So I had to realign all of that. Um, and then this is, you're seeing really like cross-section view. And then I used some scientific imaging software uh, that they use on MRIs and stuff to uh, reconstruct it in 3D, which looks like this. So this is my dust. And then um, if you go over to the art building, you can see half of it carved six feet across on the giant robot, which is amazing. Um, I'm in love with this thing, the big orange beauty. Um, and then here, here's that model in 3D. So the final version, ah, I meant to bring, I have a 3D printed one I was gonna send around, but um, I'm not sure yet how I'm gonna finish it. I'm kind of thinking now about this like color changing paint that they use for cars. I don't know if you've seen this where it like goes from green to orange or whatever, but trying to do it, this is essentially, this is a shader that kind of mimics what it looks like in the electron microscope, which is this weird like gray, black, shiny, but kind of not shiny thing. So if, if any of you are like car people and you know an awesome auto body paint place, I would be super psyched to know. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm working on here. And with that, I think I'm all done. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. I think Mike, Michael, you have a the microphone. microphone. Oh, there we go. Um, does anybody have any questions? There's one back here. Please speak into the microphone. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So uh, when you were talking about the QR code, how it was made simple enough for the computer and person to read alike, is that basically a different version of the code that is more familiarly used with the QR scanner? Yeah, um, let me jump to that here. So the idea was like, you know, a text, where are we at? Uh, you know, you see a text in the world and computers have gotten really, really good at optical character recognition, like being able to read text from a photograph. Um, this was in like 2012, so it was still not quite there. 
Um, so that's why I set it in a font that makes it easier for the computer. But then that QR code, which I'm sure you've all seen, uh, would be an even easier way. So the idea was like if you were leaving this book sitting out on a table that a computer would be able to kind of read it, uh, kind of giving it the same access as, as you might have if you're looking at something. So, yep. And then that, the QR code, uh, instead of giving it the text, gives it a link to the, a GitHub page basically with the code and the text and all that stuff in this like machine ready format basically. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, the machine that you used before with um, let me move actually, uh, with the rewiring and the setup that you made, the um, I think the record making machine or yeah, the white noise, yeah. is that what's used to create the records to the point of where the needle moves around making the actual sound? Or yeah. Oh. It's kind of crazy. So the way it basically works, it's a reverse record player. So it's got a needle, a slightly different kind of needle, but you feed sound into it and the needle moves back and forth and it cuts that groove, which is, I mean, um, nobody makes these machines anymore, basically. So uh, anybody that's doing like DIY record stuff is doing what I did, which is buying them on Craigslist and fixing them up. Um, the real machine, like the one I have is like a portable one meant for recording lectures and stuff. Um, the real ones are like bigger than this desk here and they require like huge vacuum systems. They often do it under um, like a cloud of gas, you know, like for crazy audiophile stuff, like under a cloud of gas and stuff like that. Um, and even those, like they don't make those anymore. So when they cut masters for records now, it's usually done on a machine that's really old and um, it's kind of incredible. Yeah. Thank you. But you can find them. I mean, if you want to cut records, they're findable. Any other questions? I have a question for you. Yeah. It's a little elaborate, so I wrote it down. Oh my God. Um, when you were, and you know, I think, <laughs> I, I, hopefully in some sense it'll, uh, you know, give us a little bit of an insight into what you're thinking about. Because, you know, your process is fairly convoluted. Yes. The level of research that you do and your end result. I mean, it, you know, it, there's lots of places to miss it, you yep. know. But at the same time, it's extremely engaging. So you said in seam sorting, you'd like to remove aesthetic choices as much as possible. Yeah. And I'd like to explore it a little bit. As an organization, us, that seeks to educate students to context and concept sensitive aesthetic choices, what does it mean to break this down? And what traditions are you working from? Break down uh, aesthetic choices. the relationship between the things that we think about as being the fundamentals of art making. Right. Is that what you mean? Well, well yeah. I, I'm sort of off. Yes. 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 Okay. If that's what you mean, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, so I think it, for me, it comes from a couple places. I was a painting major, if you can believe that, as an undergraduate. Um, and I, I had a, a lot of friends that were painters. And uh, this woman was saying, I wake up every day and all I want to do is go to the studio and paint. And I was like, I don't, I don't feel that way. Maybe I shouldn't be painting. And at the same time, also, I was taking like way more time, pleasure from making the canvases than from making uh, paintings. Like I made really nice canvases. Um, and it made me really think a lot about like how, how to make and what, I wanted, what kinds of things I wanted to spend my time doing and making. Um, I'm also colorblind, uh, red, green colorblind, which was like totally setting me up to not be a great painter. Um, and so over the years, I guess I just keep finding myself more interested in process and ideas and artwork that results from that than things that we normally think about or take pleasure in art. So things like composition, color, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So I guess for me, like, it's coming out certainly of like conceptual art and that kind of idea that like, the idea is the work. Um, I also think that there's a certain, like you said, like there's a certain distance the viewer has to go to be able to understand what they're looking at. Um, I mentioned this project with the supercomputer generating six billion MP3 files. They all sound exactly the same. Um, and it's shown on a bay of four hard drives in the gallery that has no power or data connection. So all you do is look at this case of hard drives, um, which is super polarizing. Like most people totally hate this thing. Um, and it requires that like extra work to kind of understand. But for me, it, like these are a rarity actually. I really struggled with these because they're beautiful. They're, they're weird and pretty. And most of my work is kind of not like that. Um, so really like, 
I don't, I don't know. I'm still struggling with that kind of relationship between how much do I want to define as an artist and how much do I want to let things happen. Um, and yet, uh, just to follow up, and then I'll give you the microphone, Tom. Just to follow up a little bit, it does seem that you, 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 you haven't, uh, you haven't just repurposed the problem of aesthetic choice. You sort of have recursively displaced mm -hmm. it, right? Because of course, as you point out, these are really beautiful things, and even the white noise, you know, which is seemingly random and has no uh, agency, so to speak. Uh, still produces in people hallucinations and all yeah. kinds of other, and at the same time, uh, highly idiosyncratic experiences, you know? Yeah. So you've sort of repurposed or displaced aesthetic choice, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you, you, haven't, you haven't defeated it or denied it in the work. No, and I mean, I think like you could talk about an aesthetic experience as being a huge range of possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can have a completely mental, cerebral aesthetic experience. It doesn't have to be tied to visual things necessarily so like the white noise maybe you don't have i mean the shop is intentionally very carefully designed and the experience of that stuff is very carefully designed but the core of it the white noise is really like a very different kind of thing or with um this work every possible photograph like you're not getting rewarding photographs but you're i want you to think about that part of it i guess for me that's really the kind of key of the work yeah. You know, I wonder if on some level, uh, oops, sorry, uh, you know, you're kind of exploring, I'm going to give the microphone over to Tom, you're kind of exploring these really extreme aesthetic potentials, hmm. things that don't exist, and you're trying to uncover them. Is that, would that be fair to say? I haven't thought about it that way. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Although, are, are you making aesthetic choices before in regards to the images that you choose to manipulate in some way or, or are they just arbitrary as well to a certain extent for sure yeah i mean there's a, for these there's a, there was a lot of experimentation it was feeding i also i think i like the um uh, like subjecting things to a process produces unexpected results in the same way maybe that you're like playing with materials and you're surprised that you know it affords a certain kind of thing i think so much of painting is kind of like that right like you're pushing around paint and it takes you years and years and years and you're still finding surprises um so with something like this, like I fed in images that I thought would produce interesting results that were just super boring um, and was really surprised that things like landscape photos ended up being really, really great, which is weird too because landscape has been a theme through a lot of my work too. Um, but then the Google search adds this again, this like remove. So I downloaded literally hundreds of photos for a certain search term. I never even really looked at the source images. I don't even know if they got saved to my computer. They just sort of like rent through this process and spat out the result kind of. Um. But, and then to add to that a little bit, the choices that even presenting today, these selections that you're showing us, were they, were they arbitrary? <laughs> or, <laughs> or were they chosen based yeah. upon something that you responded to? I mean, so I ended up with literally 10,000 yeah. images to pick from. Um, and a lot of them look very the same, and then you'd be scrolling through and you'd be like, whoa, that's, a, that's like a real surprise. Um, and then also sort of starting to see these categories of, of results. Um, so it was this kind of like iterative looking through, and um, I mean, I guess in a way it's kind of like a photographer who yeah. you know, shoots and you do a contact print, something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's that kind of like back and forth, and then maybe you tweak the algorithm or... Um, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, it doesn't feel that divorced from sure. traditional art making. It's just a different kind of like set of tools, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. So do you, I did ask about antecedents or you know previous yeah. uh, influences that make what what would some of those be? What or I mean, do you feel really much kinship with the past? I mean, I think conceptual art for sure. Um, Anybody in particular? Always. Like Bastian Otter or uh, Kosuth, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've always liked that kind of work. Um, but I think there's something overly intellectual about it, maybe. Um, and I, I, so when I was out of town the last two weeks, I, I met up with some friends who uh, we do some kind of similar work. And we were talking a lot about this. Like, I do so much research ahead of projects, like technical research, historical research a lot. Like White Noise Boutique was a lot of stuff on like World War II cryptography and um, that kind of stuff. 
uh, I've started reading a lot of CS papers now, like which is kind of weird as an artist. Um, and we were talking like who are who's the generation before us doing that kind of work, um, and we were really coming up blank. I mean, people who are really doing a lot of technical work, conceptual work, research stuff. Um, I don't know. I feel like art has opened up a huge amount maybe in the last 10 years to allow, you know, like social practice is a great example of that too, where like things that didn't used to be part of how you could make kind of opened up or you could be, I don't know, between things. Um, I didn't show any examples of this, but also like performance, music making, sound making is an important part of what I do and projects kind of, I've realized it's kind of a continuum between like making rock music and uh, making art and then like projects fall somewhere between so white noise boutique is maybe like kind of in the middle there um, I don't know in the same way I feel like as an artist you can be inspired by art like going to museums but I I don't do that so much anymore I'm reading CS papers and I'm doing this linear algebra class online and I don't know yeah any other questions great thanks so much. thank you everybody